Hello, hello, and welcome back to Lawrence Plays, and it's time for some more Factorio with the Space Exploration and Crastorio 2 mod pack. And today we're going to be taking a look into a load of transportation stuff and alcospheres and general logistics, logistical nonsenses, as, as is traditionally the way. So, let's get stuck in. The first thing I want to talk about is that Tristan has extended the amount of Tesla co coil coverage we have in the base by putting in lots of these ones up the middle of some of the trunks, of the, the busier areas of the base where trains tend to go quite a lot. And that's allowing a lot, of the tra a lot of these trains to just maintain their battery charge. So if we have a look in this one, we can see that these batteries are they're still um, about half full, despite the fact that the trains have only just arrived at one of their drop-off stations and is now being charged up by the coil here. I think we could possibly do with a few more in here, but I'm not quite sure where we put them given the range. Maybe Maybe there'd be room for another one over here, I'm not sure. But anyway, they're keeping the, they're keeping the trains nicely charged up and keeping them able to keep the boost going for as long as possible um, and give us a li that little extra bit of power. Now, not all the trains have been uh, have been fitted with the Tesla receivers yet. As you can see by this one, it's not getting zapped on its way down here. And that, But that's another thing that Tristan's been working on. He's been going around poking lots of the uh, individual trains and trying to upgrade them to uh, to the new standards. And he's worked through a lot of the ones that are, be are generally very, very busy. So ones that go to ones that go to any of the, sort of the major stations will probably have been upgraded by now, or ones that are going through and being used heavily in, in any any particular area. So ones, that, especially ones that are going up to the up into orbit, because all of these ones they, they they have to go. I was going to say they have to go a bit further. That's not necessarily true, because I think our ground bait factory is a lot bigger than the one up in orbit. But these are the ones that are going through something a, a very much a bottleneck, because the space elevator, despite being absolutely fantastic, is very much a bottleneck, because you can only have one train going through it at a time, which is kind of why we have another one over on the other side of the base as well. Um, I say one at a time, that's one up and one down at the same time, but even so it's still a, it's still a bit of a bottleneck in the factory. He's also been threatening that in the next stream he's going to go around stealing all any trains he can find anywhere around the entire factory and bringing them to somewhere appropriate where they can be upgraded and, and fixed. Because I think at the moment all of the upgrading things that I showed you last week, like these little modules that put all of the bits and pieces into the trains, these ones are only available down on the ground because we're only making this stuff down on the ground so it's not being shipped up. So I think what he's planning to do is to start bringing all of the trains that just bimble around up in space down to the ground, give them a quick sharp upgrade and then send them back up in to space again so they can start running around at a much much higher speed so that'll be quite nice He's also been monitoring some of the alerts that pop up down here when we start to run out of things or run low on things. As you can see, that's a bit of a it's a bit of a thankless task because there's always something that's complaining, something that's a problem. At the moment, we're low on so many different things, and we've, and we've got too much of some things as well. That's why it's complaining about many cores on Norvis in two different places, interestingly. But the one I want to look at at the moment is the wood supply, and that so that had actually run out. We got to the point where the uh, the wood was running low, and and it's a weird problem to have because you'd think at this stage of the game we'd hardly be using the well, we would just wouldn't be using the wood at all. Uh, but it turns out, well, it's needed for greenhouses apparently, by the looks of it. Uh, I don't think we're really making those at the moment, so that's probably not too much of an issue. It's needed over here to make med kits and whichever, possibly whichever of the bots these are. No, that's not enough. That was just squeezed in there because it's a convenient place for it. But they're needed for those. It's used over here in order to make coke, in order to make the uh, the the military sciences. So that's a thing we definitely need, and we get through. So I can see why that's probably why we've suddenly run low because we're doing lots and lots of energy weapon and similar down uh, researches recently, and that's going to be a lot of military stuff down here. We're using a smidgen of it for in order to make uh, apparently in order to make what 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 even are you biomethanol? Okay, in order to make some of the antibiotic capsules. So this little bit will be used over there. I can't see that being particularly heavy on it though. And that's the end of it on the bus. However, I did skip over one as I was going along here. Way back up here, more or less in the middle of the bus, we've got a feed of wood coming off here. And this is being brought up to be turned into processed fuel. Now, it, it's a low priority, or it's at least it's a, it's, a, it's a medium priority, because we have a huge amount of processed fuel that's being produced from wood and oil byproducts and various other things out on the exoplanets. And so that's being brought over by a train to goodness knows where. I, I, you know, the drop-off train will come in here, drop it off. It'll come up this way and then be passed down through the uh, through the stations over here. So we've got a big buffer storage area for it up here. Then then we pass it down through here, and if it's fl if these belts are flowing, that means these machines can't run. So that'll flow it down here, and it'll go into here, where it can be taken away to fuel all of our train systems. But if there's a shortage of that, then up here, well, we have a system that's bringing in wood and rocket fuel, and it's using the wood by priority, but if we run out of wood, then we will start using rocket fuel in order to make processed fuel, in order to feed it over here to make to keep, keep the trains running. And it looks like we've had a bit of a hiccup in the, in the, uh, in the 
in the wood supply because there's quite a lot of rocket fuel on the uh, on the belt up here. And if we have a look at some of these machines, okay, that one's running on uh, wood and rocket fuel, sure. I, uh, that one's rocket fuel, that one's rocket fuel. So you can see quite a lot of rocket fuel has made it up here, but we prefer to be just making it from wood. And so we've, uh, so Tristan's been looking at this and sorting it out. And I noticed that right way back over here, there is now a belt feeding the wood in up here. And that's coming from all the greenhouses down here. Now, I don't know why these stopped. And this we're also feeding wood up to this train as well. Where, where even are wood drop stations? I have no idea. There is one over here that um, was that Tristan put in and is actually just a sink at the moment. I, I, I think this used to have some delivery cannons above it. And this was shipping out all of these things off to some of the other planets to be made into... Oh, with that lot. Um, I think that's for making meteor defense ammo. But I have to admit, I'm not certain. And there's another one over here where wood is being brought in. Ah, yes, wood is very important for making steel. So the old iron smeltery area had its own um, own greenhouses that were growing wood just off the side of it. The new one doesn't and is bringing it in by train. For that, we do need to have a station available that is providing large quantities of wood whenever we need it. So we have a uh, we have we have a drop off here that's bringing it up to be made into uh, into coke to be made into steel. But that means we do need to be making it down here, at, and at a decent rate as well. And we can see that, well, it's it, it's trickling through because, you know, trees grow slowly. They're kind of known for it. Um, but that's all going out onto the bus as a priority, and then up here into the station as a lower priority. Up here we have a very, very old station design. Uh, it's using five warehouses, where uh, one will do. But over here we have a quantity of wood in each of the uh, each of the warehouses. It's gradually They're gradually being filled up. We've got 71 stacks in each warehouse. So we're doing pretty well here. I think we're going to have... Uh, we, we've got enough for a train to come in a couple of times over and fill up. Um, well, one, one, and a, one and nearly a second time over and fill up. So we're probably going to be okay. I'm going to hope that somebody's keeping a bit of an eye on these. Uh, we could put modules in them if we're desperate, but we may need to put in more more greenhouses down here to make more, 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 more wood potentially in the future. We'll, we'll keep an eye on it and see if that's necessary. Sticking with the uh, transport and trains theme, Tristan has also put in a uh, an, an additional train that will take oil away from the, uh, the, the, the core processing area over here and take it to wherever it's needed because he noticed that one of them wasn't de wasn't dealing with it quickly enough and we're starting to get an oil backlog over here now we seem to be capable of churning through all of the oil as fast as we need to i don't think we've actually got a shortage of it yet although if we do we can then go off to the um the oil moon up here at erio and start mining it from there in huge quantities bring it over that that's that's not a problem we can do that if we have to but as far as i'm aware at the moment this system over here is basically keeping up so these tanks that actually fill the train up are all full this one here is mostly empty this one here is very, very empty. Uh, this system feels a little bit suspicious and off to me because we're pumping the oil out of this tank and therefore, and thereby meaning that there isn't enough oil in here to fill the wagon up when it turns up. So that seems a bit a bit suspicious to me. I'm not sure that's the best way to be doing it. However, maybe it was some just, just way of cobbling in a little bit of extra storage space over here when we were really, really struggling. Uh, that said, if we look between these two, there is uh, almost 40,000 in here. That is going to be enough to fill a, a fill a wagon up because they fill up to 25,000, I think? Yes, 25,000. So we do have enough in these, but the fact that we're pumping it out into these tanks, and um, there's 50,000 in each of these, makes me worry a little bit that we might be calling a train at the wrong sort of time because we're feeding all of that Oh no, we're only feeding the 40,000 that's in these two down here into it and then triggering when, presumably when that hits 100,000. This whole system here is a bit broken. Someone should take a look at this. This should actually be, um, I suppose this should be 30,000, like that. And then, well, we'll immediately call a train. Because if there's 30,000 in these two tanks down here, we should be able to fill up a, a, a fluid wagon here without too much difficulty. And that means that all these other tanks are full, because if they weren't, we'd be pumping it straight out of them. And so that should be all right. It's, yeah, I... I'm not sure I really like the system we've got set up here, but I think that now at least will allow the train to come out a little bit sooner, and we'll see, yes, suddenly one of them, at least one of them is on its way over. <laughs> so speaking of core chunks, Tristan says that we can currently process them slightly faster than they're being unloaded. Uh, the fact that this warehouse here is full suggests that's not right. However, the fact that this belt isn't flowing, a belt has got rotated in there. Let's put that back. I don't know whether that's the right thing to do or not. It, there's a belt coming up here with a load of iron ore on it. I don't know what's going on around here. This is all seems to be a bit weird and a bit wrong and a bit just horrible. Um, but whatever it was, it was clogging up the belt system along here. As you can see now, these are all starting to empty. So presumably that means that we may start to see the amount... Yeah, we can already see the amount in here starting to drop. Although a train's just pulled in, so I don't know. Uh, it's all a little bit broken down here. I think what we actually need is for this to be here. And then to have a belt come around like this. 
and feed it in like that. This should probably all be green. It doesn't really matter though. Uh, let's make it all green just for the sake of it. Uh, yeah, and then feed this in at the top here like that rather than trying to sideload it onto this belt, which is going to be problematic. Um, this should now work a little bit better. But, you know, little, little fixes here and there and, and things will maybe hopefully start to be a bit, work a bit more nicely. Uh, where does this even come from anyway? Oh, this is the unloading system from the trains bringing the dump stuff down from orbit. So, yeah, and as you can see, we've got rather a lot of iron ore um, stockpiled in here because it can't get out because it was trying to sideload onto a belt up here, which I've just blocked, essentially. So, we, we're, we're, But once that gets built around the top there, then this should drain out into this strong box nice and quickly, and hopefully things will then be okay. So yes, let's check. Let's check Tristan's suggestion again. So we now he now says we are capable. Theoretically, we are capable of processing the uh, the core chunks slightly faster than we're bringing them in. Um, as I say, this still appears to not quite be true. Um, he also says we're capable of process or transporting them and processing them a little bit faster than they're they're being produced. So in that case, we should be. Th th that means that this system here is sufficient for dealing with the number of core miners we have running at the moment. Um, I'm not sure I 100% agree with it because in the time I've been watching, this this warehouse has not been emptying, even though we have a ste pretty much steady stream of everything going out here, and all of these machines are working and it's it's coming through. So I I kind of dispute what you're saying. Although these there are a couple up here that aren't running. Oh, I don't know. It yeah. What a, I think the, the point when you want, but the point, the important point here is that everything is capable of running at a nice, healthy speed. We're getting lots of core chunks coming in. We're getting lots of uh, resources coming out. Maybe we could nudge it to run a little bit faster, but we probably don't need to. Let's try and keep an eye on the number of core trains down here, though, and just see if see if, see if the system catches up in general. Moving away from the ground for a little bit, I talked last week about how um, the snow, snowdrop ship was broken, among many, many other ships that were broken. This one was fairly simple. It was just a missing cable across here because then only half of an upgrade had been done. Uh, now Tristan's finished up the, off the upgrade and linked in the final cable, and now the snowdrop ship is working very, very nicely, as you can tell by the fact that we have an entire full warehouse of cryonite up there, a decent chunk of cryonite down here, and a ship that is trying to unload, but it can't because this warehouse is completely full of cryonite. So, yeah, it's in a slightly odd position because we've got this this this, this weird problem where the, the the ship can't unload a thing that could be unloaded, i.e. the trash that goes up to here, because there's too much. But in this case, it's too much of the thing that we actually want. So, I don't really care. I think as long this, this will continue to run until this until the, all of the cryonite has come out of this warehouse. So we're not going to run out for a good while. And in that time, this is going to be unloading the cryonite from this this ship here. And I was going to say that's the only thing that needs to be unloaded from the ship. But no, there's some, still some barrels left over here. It's 50 barrels, which is nothing. But they can't be passed over into here until we until we've un unloaded all the cryonite out of this warehouse and therefore out of this warehouse. So it's a silly position to be in, but. The position of having too much of a resource is not a position I'm going to complain about. So, And it's a position that will just sort itself out happily, and we won't have any supply shortages because of it. So, you know what? It actually doesn't matter. It's just slightly silly. If only you could lock slots in a warehouse and say, well, I want this, this one down here to only be for sand, I want this one to only be for stone, and so on. And that way you could ensure that everything in there could always be pushed through. But, no, it, it, as I say, it doesn't matter. So we're not gonna, I'm not going to worry about it at, at all, other than to just spend five minutes talking about it thinking about it and going, uh, in the video. <laughs> and that's quite enough of that. Up also up in the spaceport, I've updated the uh, the, the junk the, the sulfur train that comes in here to unload all the sulfur into the system that is then being passed through to go to all of the places that require sulfur, but mostly stardust. Uh, so we've got we've got a nice healthy system here now, I hope, where we're bringing in. Yes, you can see there's a nice a nice stream of sulfur flowing in over here that's loading up these two uh, strong boxes over storehouses over here. With a, and this is the excess sulfur that's coming over from Terras because as I've said before, immersite processing generates huge quantities of um, of sulfur. So we need to do something with all of that. And the something is that we feed it over into these warehouses. That then gets passed out along here. So when the next Stardust ship goes, it will take it from here, which means it will take it from this, this storehouse and then from this storehouse as a priority over this one. But when that runs out, we can still pull that through. And that means that this train is still quite busy. Um, however, I've added in an extra stop on its schedule to tell it to come over here and pick up junk from whichever one of these stations along here needs to get rid of some scrap, uh, need to get rid of some trash and take it down to the ground, and then of course unload it down on the ground before it fills up again with sulphur and then brings the sulphur back up here. So it's it's an extra stop, but I think we've now we we built this up to a high enough level of sulphur that I think that's probably going to be okay. If we start to have crises, then I can turn it off, I can tweak it, I can fiddle with it, and all that sort of stuff. Sure, but in the meantime, I think I'm quite happy with this with this train bit having an extra role to play whenever it goes up and down. Additionally over here, so we had a problem, and I think I talked about this last week, but it got a lot worse. So the Talos N ship, that's this one, the one that does the uh, the Naquium, brings the Naquium over. 
uh, and all the supplies out that for Nequim going in the other direction, had unloaded an enormous quantity of stuff that it shouldn't have been doing. And we think that happened because some positive numbers came over. So Mark has gone through and he's upgraded all of the stations along here, all of the spaceport uh, drop-off areas, to have the new system which uses four um, com combinators across the top here. And I explained all of this in the How Mark Spaceships Works video. So uh, check that one out if you want to, if you want to, the, the full description. But that, but we suspect, that's the only thing we can come up with that is why it was unloading stuff that it shouldn't have been. But it meant that the entire un the unload system over here had jammed up with things like vulcanite and methane ice and sulfur. And so we eventually want to, we, we've got this system here that's now going to loop them round like this and pass them up into, into here to be put back into the ship. But we've, we've put in a bit of a, a hold on it because we don't want to overload these systems, these warehouses over here with these, with, with the excess things. Um, and, and then and then have them not able to load the things we actually want to be loading into the ship. As you can see, these are all very, very full. They're all about 400 stacks worth of stuff. So we'd like a couple more of the... Uh, we'd like the Talos N ship to come through a couple more times and, uh, and, and take some of this away. And then once that's happened, we can unload a bit more of the stuff from here. This shouldn't happen again, and therefore we shouldn't be putting any more in stuff into this warehouse. So it doesn't matter if we forget about that. But there is a lot of stuff in here that we do want to get rid of and pass over to the, uh, the other um, the, the other, other site if we can. So we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on it. We'll, we'll poke, poke it every so often and see what happens over here. We also seem to have rather, a, rather an excess of the Naquium crystals, or Naquitite crystals, whichever they're called. And that had jammed up the system along here. So I've put in an additional warehouse along here that's, that's taking some more excess. And hopefully that'll take the pressure off it. And we'll be able to, um, we'll be able to fill, it, fill the trains up over here from all of, the, all of the loads over here. And hopefully this will be enough to keep the system a bit more balanced and a bit more sensible, a bit more under control. As it is, we had a little bit of a problem. But as, as you can see now, we, we have a shortage of Naquium ingots. We have plenty of Naquium crystals. So let's have a quick look at Talos and see if things seem to be behaving themselves over there based on the shortages we were seeing. And yes, we can see that the uh, the Naquium ingots are flowing through and they're going into the train and filling that one up and the Naquium crystals have stopped being passed through. So it looks like things are working as they should. We've got a nice healthy supply of crushed Naquitite here. We've got a trickle of the uh, of the ingots coming through. Yeah, I, I, I wish this was a bit faster, but it is working. The system is, is running much as I would expect it to be. So yeah, I think I think that's okay. Oh, and that train's gone, so yeah, we're gonna, yeah the, the system is, is ticking over, it's churning through it, and eventually this one will fill up and then it'll depart to take the, uh, the ingots up, in, up into orbit to be put into the spaceship. The next thing I want to talk about is still transport related in fact. Well, it's sort of transport related in that it's a spaceship. Uh, and this is another another one of uh, Mark's new builds. And he's built this one up to go off and run the Nexus. So I talked about this a little bit last week in that we'd researched the Nexus building. That's this thing here. But this is a weird a weird system. So the way it works is you, you give it lots and lots of blank data cards, as you can see is happening here. They're all passed through into, the, into this chest down here on the ship. And then that passes them into this, into the Nexus machine itself. And the Nexus machine will turn Turn, we'll turn the, the uh, blank data cards into these interstellar travel data cards when the ship is moving. And the ship has to be moving at a decent speed. It has to be out in interstellar space and it has to have an enormous amount of power available. Because the faster the ship goes, the faster it will generate these cards, but also the more power it will use. And it's a non-linear uh, arrangement as well. So if it goes faster, if it goes twice as fast, it'll probably use four times as much power, but it'll generate twice as many cards or something like that. I don't know the exact numbers, but it's it's that sort of non-linear relationship. And so this ship is very, very fast, as you can tell by the huge number of um, engines on the back of it. Oh, I don't know if we can find its current, its, its actual maximum speed, but I do know that Mark has limited it uh, using by by hooking it up to the, uh, the some accumulators on it somewhere. Oh, here we go, the dark Naquium accumulators. They're hard to spot because they're sort of black. Um, so he's linked linked up to a few of those, and then he's controlling the ship's speed based on the based on the power signal in those accumulators, allowing the ship to go up to up to three hundred speeds uh, at its absolute maximum. Um, but that'll drop. That'll be pulled down a bit if the, if if the ship starts to struggle with power generation. Uh, and that can happen if the Nexus is pulling in all of the power, so it's going too fast for that, or if the, or if we're taking too much damage from asteroids and the shields and the lasers can't keep up, or at least if the shields and the lasers are using too much power in order to keep the ship alive and therefore draining the amount of power. So it's quite a quite a neat system. The speed of the ship will be will be at the maximum that the amount of power generation on board can cope with, and so and so that has allowed us to generate lots and lots of these data cards. As you can see, they're all pouring out up into here. And then being and flowing out around here to be presumably, I was going to say to be put into a train, but no, they're just going straight into the uh, into the Deep Space Science Four production that's going to be running up here once it's finally finished. As part of making that, Mark had to make the the Nexus itself. He had to make Nequium heat pipes in order to transfer the heat around inside the ship to make a sensible design in there because he's using the antimatter reactors for it. So so he's making the normal Nequium heat pipes here, and then he's making the long versions of them here, which are 
they're, 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 they're longer, basically, and that means that you can put, you can have longer runs of heat pipe without losing as much heat. And if we look in here, you can see the, the different versions. You've got the normal Naquium heat pipe, so that's, that's a, a one by one. You can put these down as to link things up like that. Alternatively, you've got the, then the, these are the ones he's made, which are a bit longer. These are five, and they've got a join point in the middle like that to allow you to hook other stuff up to them. So I could put another heat pipe in here, for example, uh, and run it off, 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 that, off that one like this. And also then there's the, the really, really long ones that allow you to link up longer areas. And because each one of these counts as a single thing, you can make them, you can transfer heat a lot more efficiently over long distances with them. And, yeah, okay, there we go. There's some bots build, building them all up for me. He's also made the Naquium accumulators up here. What do they cost? So that's a, a Holmium accumulator, Naquium cubes, and superconductor cables. That's not too bad, actually. It, yeah, it's a couple of accumulators and, and eight, eight connect cables. But, yeah, that's that's actually reasonable. I, I can see we, we may end up starting, starting to use these a little bit more on spaceships. He's doing a, quite a lot of robo network bring, for bringing stuff in for these, which I, uh, I disapprove of a little bit, but to be honest, it's not that bad. I don't think we're going to be getting through a huge number of these, so it, it's not too awful. Over here, no, no, no robo network over here. I'm glad to see. Uh, so over here, what do, you, what do you require for these things? A superconductor cable and naquium plate. Yeah, seems reasonable. And then down here, the Nexus requires um, superconductor cable, which we have. Naquium processors, which we don't appear to have on the bus. Oh, yeah, because they're they're really really expensive. We're never going to put those on the bus. This is one of those areas where even I'm not going to complain because the sheer cost of making those processors makes me not want to fill up huge numbers of belts with them. And to be honest, the same with the Tesseracts. The heavy assemblies are just about on the borderline of that. That one I'll accept as bringing in um, by uh, on, on the belts um, because we already are and it's probably my fault we are so you know <laughs> and same with the aeroframe bulkheads those two are just they're only the mid-tier exotics the iridium and the beryllium so I don't mind too much with those whereas the naquium ones it feels like it's getting a little bit too far unless actually it's not even the naquium that's the level where I start to think oh that's a bit expensive it's anything that requires arcosphere levels of processing so that is the tesseracts and the processors the rest of it you see I've got the I've got the naquium cubes and the uh, and the naquium plates on the belt over here and yeah quite happy with that and so that has made him a Nex, well he's made two, he's probably made three Nexus, Nexi, and four Nexi. Uh, one to go in the ship, to go, two to go in the inventory of this machine, and one to go in this box down here. Uh, but that's allowed him to then go off and get those data cards, which we need for doing Deep Space Science 4. Speaking of Deep Space Science 4 and Arcospheres and all that should become, and all that's sort of vaguely linked up to them, uh, Mike has put in a major upgrade to the Arcosphere system over here. So instead of having one stack filter inserter, the white ones in here, unloading the Arcospheres onto this belt, he's upgraded it to a pair of superior long filter inserters. And that means he can put them in like this. In, in Is that in series? I mean, technically, they're, they're in series because there's one in front of the other, but they're actually in parallel because they're working together and they're not passing from one to the other. So each time a signal comes down from here, both of them will grab one of that particular arcosphere types. So if you watch closely through the uh, through all through the haze of of, of uh, control systems on the belt here, you can see that each time it's two of the same coming out. Uh two of the same colour, and they're all being passed out. So that's allowing us to get two of each one going out. So even if this system down here is running flat out, these are only going to grab one of the pair going through, leaving the other ones for the other machines around the top here. He spent some time doing the doing the maths on this to keep the system running as fast as possible. He eventually worked out that it takes 17 ticks for one of these superior long inserters to flick from one side to the other and back again. And so he set up a system along here to count the clock along every 17 ticks, but that didn't work. He then realised that it also takes a tick to pick up and to drop off at the other end. And so he decided to round over to a nice round 20 ticks for each one. So you see this one, this one runs on 20, this one runs on 40, this one triggers on 60, 80 and so on, all the way across here. And so this then resets the count on 170, bringing it all the way back down again to zero and then allowing it to run back through here. And that means that we get a pair of each one of these arcospheres being fed out as long as the warehouse at the end has sufficient of them in there. And that's not guaranteed. We are we are still a little bit short of arcospheres, but the system is going quite is, is running quite nicely. As you can see, there's a, a nice healthy stream of everything going around here. We've got all of the different data cards down here, so those are all running fine. We've got a full belt of tesseracts. We've got a full belt of processors over here. Everything seems to be on a full belt of these swirly data as well. So everything along here seems to be working really quite nicely. We've got all the Arcosphere recipes running very, very nicely. So I guess that means it's time to expand it and put a and, and, and throw in another spanner into the works along here. He did also upgrade these belts along here to deep space belts. Now, I said in last week's video, or when I when I tried doing that, I then hang on a minute, that's not actually going to help. But in this case, it does actually help because this this extra speed of these belts is required when the whole system is working in order to get the uh, the arcospheres all the way around and back into the warehouse in time for them to be put back on here. So it's not it's not affecting the number of them that are, that are flowing through because you can see the belt clearly isn't full. We could have a belt running at half the speed, and as long as we didn't run out of arcospheres here, we'd have just as many 
many going round per per hour or whatever me uh, time based metric you want to use. However, if all of these machines are running, they're taking up quite a few of the arcospheres, and so the extra speed of belt is useful because it means they get back to here, ready to be chucked out onto the belt the next time that tick comes round, and so. With that, with that boost of speed, it means the system can keep running fast enough. And he's upgraded all the belts around here as well, because you might as well. It gets them back into the system that bit quicker, and, you, and you, your arcospheres are then available to be put, pl pl passed out to wherever they're needed. So, yeah, that's quite a neat upgrade. And he says that this has got the system to a point where it's now pretty much stable. And you can see if we watch this one, um, yeah, when it's not doing anything, we've got, we've got enough now that there's a decent stock of all of them in there. However, when all of these systems start running, we're a bit borderline. Sometimes you dip down to zero arcospheres of one or t one or two types available in the warehouse. So it's not. So the system works, but it's not quite got enough arcospheres in it. And so we've been sending out the uh, the, the interstellar uh, ships again, once again. The uh, the Caladrian and the Deep Space Exploration have been flying off to parts unknown. I say parts unknown. I've got a list of them over here. They've gone out to interstellar barons and solar entralis and poltergeist and interstellar grotto. And that was one. That was one run from the uh, Caladrian, and from that route, it's managed to pick up at least 24 arcospheres. And we don't know how, exactly how many in Interstellar Grotto because we haven't checked yet. But uh, yeah, we've got at least 24, and it's probably going to be about 31 from those. Good looking at the numbers he was getting, and you'll notice those are all in a nice, neat cluster. And that means you, you uh, and they're also quite close to Kalidas. Yeah, it's all very, very close to Kalidas. So that probably went out in a single flight. It didn't do the Fenestra trick at all. It just went out to all of these and then flew straight back to Kalidas. The other one went out to Godash, Galactic Graffel and Bumperfield. They're not really a cluster, they're quite a long way apart, but they're also close enough together that you might as well pick them up at the same time. It's not worth doing the Fenestra trick. However, I think it is worth doing the Fenestra trick to get out there. So those three have been grabbed as well, and that's another, probably another 20 or so Arcospheres. And then it'll, it'll have Fenestra back from Bumperfield to get back down to Kalidas, because you can see that's quite a long way. And then these ships are back here in, in orbit, well, ready to dock in, in Norvis orbit, because Mike went off to bed, and we, and we well, while the ships were on their way back. And so you can see over here, we've got a nice healthy supply of Arcospheres, and there's 30 of them, my estimate was fairly close. And they can all be chucked into the polarization machine at the top here, which will put them into the system, and then we'll have quite a few more. Bring us up to a healthy total of 199. Well, we've gathered 199. Uh, we've not folded all of them yet. We've only folded 144 of them so far. So that means we picked up another 55 in the last stream, and that's that's quite a lot. That's pretty impressive, given that we've we've already got quite a lot of them gathered. So yeah, things are going well there. Although, as I touched on last week, we have lost six of them. The factory search doesn't find them. They seem to have just actually disappeared, which is a bit of a shame, but never mind. We, we got up to 190 three of them now. So that's a decent number. I think we, it, it should be enough to keep the system running. I'd like to have just over 200, but send the ships out once more and we'll have probably 240, 250. So I think we're going to be doing pretty well for them. I've already talked quite a bit about the, the arcosphere part of, um, of what's going on around here, but it's also worth mentioning that we've got the Deep Space Science 4. We've made some progress towards it, should we say. Um, Mike has put in a train which can now steal these two particular types of data cards from over in the Deep Space 2 area. So over here, I haven't really looked at this yet. What's he done to, what's he done to my nice pretty factory? Okay, he's put, he's put another station in it. I guess that's acceptable. <laughs> so over here, yes, he's tapping out two of the uh, two of the data cards. Conveniently, they happen to be on the same belt. That was um, a, a lucky coincidence. I, did, I, didn't, I didn't plan that ahead, but it was convenient. So uh, he's able to grab them off the belt here, and it's passed through here, up, up along here. I wonder what was actually supposed to be running along this column. Um, okay, well, I hope we don't need the nanomaterial any further down. I don't think we will. I think that's probably going to be absolutely fine. <laughs> They're then passed over here, over here into this station. We have a train that will come along and pick up a load of those. You've seen this sort of system before many, many times. And that brings them then up to here where they can be dropped off. And then we've got a belt that brings them, brings them down, pass them into this machine here, which then takes those in along with uh, cubes and cryonite and date, more data cards. Interesting. Um, okay, so it takes in two data... It takes in two program data cards, two blank data cards, and outputs four program data cards. That's actually quite generous for an advanced recipe like this. Normally they'll take in sort of half a dozen of those data cards, spit out one program data card of the new type and give you some junk ones back. But no, this is actually quite generous. I'm, um, <laughs> I'm surprised. Uh, and so that's that's uh, one of that that's one of the cards there. Then there's a second one being made down here uh, from the swirly swirly data. Those are coming in here. There's a third one is the deep space exploration data that we talked about with that new spaceship. And then there's a fourth one as well. And that's the reality hypergraph analysis data, and that takes Naquin processors, but nothing really else other than that. And it doesn't take a huge number of those either. So I think this is going to be quite an easy one to implement. We'll drop in another machine, probably up here somewhere to keep it out of the way of the Arcosphere area. 
and then that will quickly be able to produce these um, these these data cards as well. And then we can start making Deep Space Four catalogs. We can feed those down to here and start making Deep Space Four science packs. And wow, then we're going to be re really closing in on on end game stuff. That's 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 amazing. Admittedly, the recipe for those does require Naquin processors, so it's going to be expensive, but we are making those gradually, so we'll, yeah, we'll start making those, and that, that's, that's going to be quite exciting. And then it's just going to be Advanced Science 2 left to do, and that also requires um, Arcospheres as well, so we'll, um, yeah, we'll, be, we'll, we'll have to squeeze that in around here somewhere. I, I guess that's why, that's why I wanted to put the other, the, um, pop, the whatever that it was data up here, and then, ha then we can have a spur coming off here like that, and then we'll need another 100 Arcospheres to fill the system up and keep it, keep it happy. So, so, uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. There is, of course, always an awkward science pack around here. And, and this time, this is the awkward data card. Because, yeah, okay, it takes in Arcospheres. That's it's a little bit awkward, but that's not too bad. The awkward part of this is that it outputs cool thermofluid instead of warm thermofluid. Everything else around here outputs warm thermofluid. So we've got a dump belt down, we've got a dump pipe down here that can just feed it into this one. It'll flow all the way down to the bottom and be cooled down there. However, this one is far too good to output nice warm thermofluid, and we can't just leave it in a puddle on the ground to pick up to, to heat up in the sun, unfortunately. So with that one, we ha we then have to oh, and this one as well also feeds out cool. So we then have to pass those up to here, and then we and then uh, Mike has decided that rather than running a really 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 long pipe all the way down here, which technically there is room for, because if you look along here, there is there is a gap to, uh, along here where we could run a warm a warm fluid pipe with only a few hops to get over some of these these pipes along here. Run that down to here, and then feed it into these tanks down. This one, yeah, this is no, yeah, cool thermofluid. We can feed it into here and then get it to be processed by this facility. Instead, he's decided it would be easier, and to be honest, I don't blame him, it is a lot easier to put in, just put in a couple of hypercoolers up here. And those, yes, they produce warm thermofluid, but we have a disposal system for that. And then it'll also, as a, as, a, as a sort of the byproduct, for want of a better word, it'll produce a little bit of that super cooled thermofluid, which we can then pass out back into the, into the system. At least I hope he is. Where does this go? Comes down here. Okay, it's being fed back in over here. Uh, this pipe is completely full. Have we run into a problem here? Yes, we probably have. Okay, we're going to... Given that, we're going to need some sort of prioritization system, I think, to make sure that we can always get rid of the uh, super chilled from here. It hasn't been a problem yet, I think, because the pipe that we seem to be able to squeeze it through from here into these machines. We might find that it actually isn't a problem because this this being such a, so much shorter a pipe than the one that comes from all the way down there, the pressure will work on our sides. I'm not sure I want to bet on that though. So we may well we'll keep an eye on it. But worst case, we can put in a tank over here with a with a, and, and set up a prioritization system. It's not it's not going to be the end of the world because I don't think we're going to have very much thermofluid coming through from here. It's a shame there isn't a, a recipe where you can just warm up thermofluids and we put it in a sort of the opposite of a radiator where it'll just allow it to sort of be gently heated up. Perhaps using some electricity you, you could pass it through a boiler and it could turn it from cool thermofluid into warm thermofluid and you could dump it back into the system. But as far as I'm aware that's not an available recipe. <laughs> Mike has also said that his other task around here was to l lament the sheer quantity of spaghetti he's generated in this area. Up until now, things have been somewhat organised, but all of this has got a bit sort of crammed in together and a bit, a bit sort of tangled. But, you know, we don't mind a bit of spaghetti in this game. It's just how things tend to go. We, we, we're, we're fine with that. Uh, we'll, we'll, and I'm sure it'll get worse as we try and squeeze in the, uh, the other remaining science packs in this area. And so that brings us on to the research. We have researched Deep Space Catalog 4 um, because, well, we're, we're ready to start making them. Now. Well, we're virtually ready to start making them. And so we want to be able to go in and program the machines up, get all of the all the various data cards they can do and uh, get all of that running and get, us, and get a little bit of a supply of some of them available as well. Like the interstellar travel data, it was good to get the, uh, the spaceship out flying out. And we've got a big pile of it available now so we don't go, oh, wait, we need to send the ship out for a half an hour before we can actually start making these catalogs. Uh, uh, oops. But no, we've got that ready now. So... We're prob we're almost ready to research Deep Space Science Pack Four, uh, but we do still need to we do still need to get the reality hypergraph analysis data up and running first, and that's the one that requires the uh, processor, as you can see. I'm slightly out of order because we also did the Nexus. We finished off researching the Nexus, and that allowed us to do Deep Space Science Catalog Four and allowed Mark to make that spaceship, and that was done first. I just apparently can't read a list in, in the right order. Uh, yay. We've done Supercomputer 4. Um, I don't know if we need that for anything, but it gets us some better recipes for d formatting data cards. There may well be some um, some of the more advanced stuff up here that actually requires these ones. I don't remember for sure, but, you know, it's faster than, than the other ones. However, it probably costs, yes, it costs 42 Naquian processors. Blimey, that, that, that's a bit pricey. Uh, we, let, let's try not to use more of those than we have to, eh? Uh, at least until we have a lot of Naquian processors available, because, yikes. 
we noticed that we had a lot of bots flitting around and some of them were crashing. Um, and I think we, 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 so we've now nudged the swarm safety up a little bit. And so if we've done six of them, that means we can have 3,000 active logistics bots. Now, we shouldn't ever have 3,000 active logistics bots on any, on any, um, in any, any given bot network because they're supposed to be used for sort of little bits of this and that. However, sometimes we do land with a spaceship and say, hello, could I have 5,000 blue belts, please? Oh, and, 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 and I might need a, another 3,000 space scaffolding and a, load, and a load of solar panels because I'm going to go out and do some upgrades. So sometimes we do actually end up using quite a lot of logistics bots and for justifiable reasons. So I think having a decent level of swarm safety is probably a good thing. The bots will still crash, but if you have swarm safety, at least they don't damage things when they do. So it, it, it's an improvement and it was fairly cheap. As you can see, it only uses very, very basic sciences and a fair amount of it, but only very, very basic sciences. So you can you can rock through quite a lot of those quite quickly. And so we did, doing four, five and six and getting us, getting us another 1500 bots of Available. We did long range star mapping uh, because we had a lot of beryllium, so we thought we'd punish the astronomic uh, research production facility area just because because why not? Let's churn through a load of those. Uh, and that's that's a, that's gathered us some more of these um, interesting patterns of unusual stars. And as it says, all of those get logged into the Informatron. And so let's let's compare this to both the Talos um, pyramids drawing and the Taras ones because I defeated that one this stream as well. And well, see if any of these any if there's any matches in, in to anything in here. It'd be uh, always interesting to check. And then as you can see, we're currently churning away at energy weapon damage 13. It's running. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we are quite a, a decent way, chunk of the way through it. And I imagine it's probably being limited by the um, by the energy science pack 4s. Let's have a quick look and see. Oh no, plenty of those. No, no, no. It's limited by advanced science pack 1 because we're, cause we're struggling with that. And I've forgotten why. I think I talked about this yesterday. Oh yes, it's because yes. <laughs> We don't have advanced science pack one over here because we don't have the the upvote data cards over here because we don't have the control units over here because we don't have the low density structures over here because we don't have the immersion plate down here because we've run out of it up here. So yeah, we need more, more ships to come in from Taras, bringing us everything we need, and then hopefully then we'll be able to fill up some buffers and you should know get everything running properly and have all of, all of the all of the everything's that we need everywhere and everything will be nice again. So yeah, a bit of a, a bit of a challenge there, but we'll, uh, we'll 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 keep this one running, keep the ship running backwards and forwards and uh, filling it up with all the all the goodies that we need and uh, keep our fingers crossed that we actually produce everything we want. And so that's the end of the episode. Thank you very much for watching. I should be back tomorrow with um, with a Warptorio stream. So yes, sun Sunday stream uh, will be start kicking off at 3:30 uh, p.m. UK time. If you're a supporter, you're very welcome to come along and join in. Uh, it's a supporter stream, so consider yourselves invited. If you're not, then come along to watch, please. It'll be it'll be another great stream. We're getting quite close to the end of Warptorio now. I think we might even be able to finish it today. I um I I, I kind of hope because we've been playing it for a while. It'd be nice. I think it's time to move on to something else. But uh, yeah, we've got a little a little way to go yet, and we'll uh, so we'll uh, we'll see how we get on. Then the day after Monday, we should be having the K2SE stream. We'll be carrying on with all of this sort of stuff, keeping an eye on the Emma site, trying to produce well, trying to keep trying to keep the entire factory happy with the inputs of that and all of the other problems that we've been finding during during these streams. Then on Wednesday I shall be back with another satisfactory stream, uh, carrying on there, and I think trying to make supercomputers, or um, no, actually no, I'll probably have made those this week. I don't know, I'm recording this on Wednesday before I actually do the stream, so I don't know what's going to be happening. <laughs> but there will be more satisfactory happening then anyway. Followed by, of course, the usual catch-up videos next weekend as well. So, thank you very much for watching. I hope to see you in all of that. Please make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on any of the stuff on the channel, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.